the Bible say school. Appreciate you being with us. We're live here on um, WMDV in Martinsville, Virginia. And I know that individuals are wondering whether or not we're going to be actually live for the whole broadcast. We definitely are. We've changed around some of our tactics. We've had several different things that we've been working on in order to get full broadcast. And so uh, here's the thing that you need to do today is tell somebody about YouTube. Especially y'all, if y'all are watching, if you're watching YouTube, you need to help the older crowd. And I'm putting myself in the older crowd. I just learned about the playlist. And all of our Genesis classes are, they're, they're still on uh, YouTube. And the thing is, though, you have to, you have to basically get yourself into a YouTube, a YouTube site, my YouTube site. Well, all you have to do is simply type in Johnny Robertson. When you get there, this is what I do. I click my face. And it takes me to the uh, main. In a minute, I'm gonna go it takes me to the main page, as you're seeing right there. A live video starts up. Those are a couple of hours of call-ins and whatnot. But here's your playlist right here. You see my cursor moving around right there. That's the playlist. You click on the playlist, and you basically then see that you can look at the Genesis classes over and over. There's 30-something Genesis classes, 20-something Genesis classes. I'm not sure, but there it is right there. You just click on that, and you start having an opportunity to go through all the Genesis classes that we've done. That's where they are. They're not hidden. We're just trying to make it more convenient. And so, uh, and you also, those of you who are not familiar with it, look, this is just a bumper. You move your cursor there until you see me, and then you click. You don't have to sit and watch that. You click on it, and all of a sudden the show comes up. It's simple as that. Now, we had some people that were having a hard time with that. I get it. Um, that's just part of TV. That's part of using YouTube on television. So my cell phone number, 276-806-2150, joeblue81 at gmail.com. Now, this morning, we are really, I'm saying we're moving on. We are in Genesis 37 is where we're going to be. That's the account of, of uh, Joseph. And I want you to basically get something out so that you can start making notes for yourself. You, this is going to be archived, so you can always go back and watch it again. But that's not going to help you when you're away from your television or your, or your smartphone. We have information in here that's going to be very valuable. And it's, I hope it's going to help you become more familiar. Now, basically, y'all, I have been immersing myself in... Um, this account, the information that's associated with this. And so I'm always, it just seems like because a, a week passes that it's like we go into this cold and I hate that, but there's really not anything else I can do about it. And so really when we start discussing uh, where we are in Genesis 37, the account of Joseph, you do need to, you need to do a little warming yourself up. And you say, what, what does that mean? Well, look at this. Genesis 35, 22. And it came to pass when Israel dwelt in that land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard it. Now, why would I bring this up? We're going to be in Genesis 37. But at the same time, you're just coming out of this other, uh, this other area. Genesis 35 is where we were. And the, th the fact of the matter is most people do not, they just don't follow through with their, their reading and their studying. And, and one of the problems is, is that the information that's in Genesis 35, it's like, well, I don't get what that had to do with anything. Uh, Jacob is basically told to pretty much clean up his act, go back to Bethel. If you remember some of our past studies, Bethel ends up being a quarrel rival for the rest of, of Old Testament history because Jacob is a patriarch. He's the father of all these, uh, these children, and he puts Bethel on the map in the sense it makes a very special place to him. And so when you have David and uh, his son Solomon reigning and then their son Rehoboam, and they split up into 10 different tribes, and the two tribes stay uh, with David in Jerusalem, all of a sudden Bethel becomes every, everywhere and it becomes headquarters. And 
when Jesus comes on the scene in John chapter 4, what does the Samaritan woman ask him? Our fathers say this mountain. Your fathers say, the Jews say this mountain. And they're basically in a constant uh, strife for over a thousand years in regard to where the city, where the, the headquarters for their religion should be. And this is where this comes from. So you are in 35 and you basically are talking about Jacob. He has gotten back into the land of Canaan. He has basically settled down and you're just reading along here and about the death of, of Rachel and all of a sudden he journeys and spreads his tent beyond the tower of Edar and the next thing you hear it came to pass when Israel dwelt in that land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah his father's concubine Israel heard it now the sons of Jacob were twelve now you might say I just don't see how that's going to be important it's going to be immediate just a second we're, we're looking at these people to help you to see reality. I don't know what you do when you read the Bible. I don't know what you, uh, what you process, how you process it. When I'm reading the book of Genesis, I am not reading to find dirt on these guys. What I'm basically doing is I'm reading one of the most realistic biographies that you will ever read. When you read a biography, unless somebody is like against the person they're writing about, you're not going to read flaws. You're going to read their high points, their great accomplishments, and you won't get reality. You, you know, you're reading about some great man, you'll probably not read that he and his wife argued a lot. Or you might not, re not, might not read that he had great uh, times of depression. You'll read the high points, his accomplishments, the great things he did, how people praise him. You won't get reality. And so when you're reading the Bible, and you're reading about Reuben, listen, this is not by design for you to come across this and say, well, he's going to hell. You are actually getting to see the kind of people that God used and the kind of things that happened to them and how they worked it out, how the big picture ends up working out, how God actually uses these individuals to accomplish his will. Why do you need to know that? You need to know that because every one of us is just alike. We're all encompassed with the same passions, the same problems, the situations that are out there that are designed to take us down. They're repeated over and over. They're just dressed up differently. Now, one of the things that you need to realize is, is or you need to think about it is, who is Bilhah anyway? And what would this have to do with anything, you know, when you start talking about the relationships that these brothers have. Well, Reuben is actually the firstborn son, and his mother's name is Leah. Leah is the, uh, is the daughter of Laban, and Joseph did not ask for Leah. Remember, he worked seven years for Rachel. His father-in-law did a switch on him. You might say, how in the world does that happen? It, you just have to put yourself in the culture. The way the marriage took place, it is a situation where at night, you go in, and I'm just saying, I, I don't really think they have all the lights on in those tents back there. You go in, and the next morning, you're married. And he comes out the next morning, and it's Leah. It's not Rachel. So Leah has children. Rachel does not. She's barren. So here you have Reuben. He's the oldest son, firstborn of Leah. He is the son of Jacob. And Bilhah is a handmaid that was given to Rachel by Laban. So in other words, you have Leah married to Jacob. Uh, Laban, her father, gives her a handmaid, a servant. Um, it's, it's, I mean, you see this in lots of different kinds of histories. Her name is Zilpah, and Rachel is given Bilhah. So what you have is you have Leah's son sleeping with Rachel's handmaid. Now, at this point, I think we can just go ahead and lay it down that um, we just have read that Rachel just died. And so I'm not saying it's just like immediately after uh, she died, that's the next thing that happened, but I'm saying it's a report. You're getting to hear this. We're kind of, we're stationed in the land. Uh, Jacob has not been back all that long. We're about to enter into a long period of discussion about Joseph and the different things that happens. 
And you need to just basically know this. This is what's going on with the family. Now, how do you think the family felt about that? How do you think that Bill Ha's son, two sons, actually thought about that? That's two individuals that are brothers, half-brothers. So what do you think they thought about Reuben going in and sleeping with their mother? Well, what do you think Jacob thought about Reuben going in and sleeping with, basically, uh, these are called his concubines, and they're called his wives. So that is a an important event. And so you might say, well, why is it important? All right, let's move to Genesis 37, and notice what happens. We're opening up now into the account having to do with Joseph. And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now you get it? That's the way the account starts in regard to the, the account of Joseph. He is, I don't know what they're doing. I'm just saying, this is what is going on. They evidently are up to something. You've got Naphtali, Dan, Asher. Uh, that's who he's with. Um, can't think of the other son right this minute, but there's four of them. And so he's with them, and he basically gives a bad report about what they're up to. As I say, I have no idea what they're up to, but I did all of that earlier. Let's see, Bilhah has Dan and Naphtali, and Zilpha has Gad and Asher. So that's who he's with. He's with Dan and Naphtali, with their flocks and their sheep, their herds, possibly his father's flocks, sheep and herds, uh, cattle, whatever. And he's with Gad and Asher as well. So he's with four of his half-brothers. And whatever they're doing, I don't know what they're doing. He comes and he basically reports back to their father. And so can you see what's being created here? Now, I would say that, um, that from what we just read, that Dan and Asher or Dan and Naphtali, they're probably not that happy with Reuben themselves. And all of this is known to all of the rest of them. And we're basically reading the things that go on. Now, is this not what goes on in our lives? Do we not know people who are relatives that end up, I know an individual that a lot of you right here in Martinsville and Henry County know that um, they are actually, were in business and it was a training exercise sort of thing. And next thing you know, folks are having relationships with brother-in-laws and uh, wife having a relationship with a brother-in-law happens all the time. So when we start seeing this kind of thing, and we try to figure out, okay, now Charles has been making a big, a big plug for a movie called Brothers Crossing, and it's actually uh, a movie that's running here in the studio, in the movie uh, theater right now. And I'm going to see it this afternoon, probably. I want to be able to see what actually is said to take place because the different churches that are involved, I don't have much confidence in them at all. They're man-made religions. But the thing is, the idea of forgiveness is such a foreign thing, and that's pretty much what this uh, movie is about, supposedly, some kind of uh, supposed to be a Christian, I got that in quotes, uh, story. And so this is the kind of thing that we're talking about. Does this break up families? Does it destroy everybody? Well, you have to be the judge as we go through this this morning. So do you get that? That's exactly why we said it came to pass. Reuben lay with his father's concubine with uh, Rachel's concubine. That would be his aunt. Rachel would be his aunt. And it's kind of weird how you can be half brother to somebody, but at the same time, uh, it's just very, very strange uh, situation the way that worked out. So that's basically what's happening. These guys are saying, hey, that's our mother you're involved with. Rachel's handmaid. So it, it doesn't, it's not like Peyton's place, gossip, or whatever, it's just allowing you to be able to prep yourself as you go into this. So you get into this, and this is exactly what you find out. Same kind of stuff, evil report on the other son. So as I say, I have no idea what they're doing. Now, 
Here's the thing. As we're looking at this, what are we supposed to be getting out of that? That was a lot of just like narrative, but you don't need to miss that. You don't not, you, you don't uh, actually become equipped with the information if you did not get that, if you didn't realize that these are the kinds of things that are going on in Genesis 35. Um, Jacob had just been told by God, he reaffirmed the promises that he was actually going to be the, the uh, bearer of the seed line, told to get rid of all of his gods, basically start straightening up. He had all of his family get rid of all of their false gods, their, their idols, their trinkets associated with the idols, the charms, the uh, earrings, the bracelets, the whole bit. They hide them under an oak and they leave that area and go to Bethel. They change their clothes. It's, it's like a sanctification uh, ceremony. And they end up going to Bethel. And then they come back to Hebron, which is where Abraham and Isaac spent a lot of their time. Isaac dies. And you just move into this particular situation. Now, here's what we're going to deal with. Psalm 5611. David says, In God have I put my trust. I will not be afraid what man can do unto me. Hebrews 13, 6, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Now, this morning, we're actually going to try to develop application from this. We, we have things going on in Jacob's family. You have Joseph who is telling the, the report on some of the brothers. You know that's causing him trouble. If you're a person has brothers and sisters and siblings, and it's your job to watch them, especially if you're younger, and it's your job not to be allowed, not to be involved in something that maybe your older siblings are involved in, and you tell it. Well, they have all kinds of names for you if you end up telling what's going on, what your brother's doing, what your sister's doing, but what do you want to do? You want to let your brother and sister actually get in trouble because you don't want to be called a tattletale or something like that? So we're basically seeing that Joseph is willing to go ahead and tell the truth about what's going on, and now we have these verses in front of us. Why? Y'all, when we develop this story, what we're actually trying to develop in all of us is a willingness to do the right thing, regardless. Now, many individuals that I'm talking to, you're not doing the right thing. I'm saying a lot of this, uh, people who watch this class are members of the Church of Christ. So you're not doing the right thing. And Somebody has to tell you, well, what happens when that somebody starts telling that y'all are not doing the right thing? Well, there ends up start being animosity, and often when a chance comes up to undercut you or to uh, cause you to stumble, man, people go for it. We got a preacher right now that uh, I'm involved with. I have been involved with him for quite some time. I don't know if he remembers or not that he was talking trash about me in front of one of my boys several years ago. I know he did not like the broadcast. He didn't like the way we do the broadcast. Now, he may have forgotten that he was doing that. But I'm basically knowing that there are plenty of people don't like the way we do our broadcasts. One of the reasons why they don't like the way we do the broadcast is because we're actually getting a lot of attention. There are lots and lots of people that love the way that we're doing the broadcast. They love the old time feel of going ahead and pointing out what's going on. No matter who gets hit, no matter what large entity uh, we name, we're going to do it. And so they know that they idolized preachers in the past that did that. Most of the time those preachers weren't picking on them. So it's easy to idolize and to have your hero be somebody who's, boy, he's wearing those folks out. But if he ever turns on you, what's going to happen? Well, they don't usually turn on you. That's how they keep your loyalty. I do not have any loyalty to anybody but the Lord. And basically, the churches of Christ are basically in the cellar, in the dump. They're not doing well. Why? Because they don't do anything. Y'all, if you're not going to be influencing... Um, <laughs> Everybody knows Matthew chapter 5, uh, 12, 13, 14. What in the world? If your light is under hid under a bushel, that's not good. If your salt has lost its savor, it's good for nothing. What, what is it good for? To be thrown out and walk trodden under by uh, the feet of men. So is it okay to say that certain churches are good for nothing? Absolutely. If you're not influencing your community, what in the world are you existing for? 
This is what we're saying. Now, what does that have to do with this? It has everything to do with this. This is the account of Joseph. Joseph is a 17-year-old who has actually been sent out by his father to check on his brothers, and he comes back and he gives a report, the reality of what's going on. What is the reality that could be going on? I have no idea, but I know that Reuben was sleeping with one of his father's wives, two of these other brothers. It's their mother. And not only is it their mother, it is jo actually Joseph. That's his mother's handmaid. I am sure that he was taken care of by Bilhah if she was the handmaid. That's what that's all about. Like, I'm not saying that was his nurse, but I'm saying that is what that's all about. So, so you have this stuff that, that goes on, and individuals may actually say, well, you know, I, I don't see how these people ended up the way they did and how they felt about each other. Well, you didn't read the context. When you start seeing this underlying stuff, and, you know, I, I, just, I just have to say this again, it's the same underlying stuff that all of us deal with. There's somebody in our family that's doing the same thing. These kind of things happen. What do you do with it? Well, you certainly don't do what they did. That's the whole point of trying to go through this lesson and learn from it. Now, so here we go. Are you worried about what men will do unto you? No, I am not. Well, some people might say, Johnny, I've heard y'all talking a lot of stuff about a lot of things. It, it's, is it okay if I narrate some of this stuff that's going on to you? But that doesn't mean that I'm going to stop. And it really doesn't mean that I'm worried about it. If I were just like super worried about it and it was really getting to me, what would happen? You would be hearing me just really go to battle. I'd be slinging and we'd be throwing dirt and mud and all that kind of stuff. No, it's not. This is not personal. This is basically us trying to get through. Uh, it's get through and do kingdom work, continue to do kingdom work that brings glory to God and to his son. And so what do you do? You basically say, look, guys, give it up. You cannot hurt us. How in the world do you end up developing a mentality like that? Y'all can't hurt us. And that's what we're going to do today. Notice Psalm 105, 17. If I had to say there's an outline for this account, I would say that one of the best outlines is actually Psalm 105, 17. This is basically a psalm where you go in and you have the opportunity to have inspiration, somebody that's inspired, look back at historical events and tell you what was going on. So David is actually talking about Joseph. He sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant, whose feet they hurt with fetters. He was laid in iron until the time that the word, that his word came. The word of the Lord tried him. Now let's go there. Psalm 105, let's see what I have. Psalm 105, the word tried him. The Lord, the word of the Lord tried him. Now, he has been given dreams. I think we all know that. Psalm 105, 18. All right, now watch this. You know, it really is helpful if you have a, a laptop or a regular computer, something that's not an Apple product. This Bible program is free. It is very useful. Uh, we can tell you some books to use so that you can actually look up words. And the idea that's actually being put forth here is if you're looking at the words, whose feet they hurt with fetters, he was laid in iron. Now, the literal, you might say, that, what, what's the literal? You know, there are different ways that words are translated. And... The literal translation is actually that he became iron. From the root of 1269, iron is cutting by extension, an iron implement, a head, or iron. The idea is, as a result of him being involved in this, he himself ends up becoming iron. Now, you may not have heard that. You might want to actually look that up and study that for yourself. The word of the Lord was trying him. So... When we think about Joseph, we need to think about the fact that 
he is actually being put through some uh, tests, some trials that are making him a different man. They're giving him perspective. Now, you know, you really do have to think through this if you're, if you're going to get anything from it. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5. And I just, for the life of me, I can't figure out why people use verses the way they use them. Now, you hear that he is actually being tried. We know that he was put in prison. We know events associated that with that. We'll try to cover some of that this morning. You know these difficult things happened to him, but in your mind, you may be saying, these, this is like punishment. This is something that I would not want to go through. Well, here's the thing. If you look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5, and we're going to look at more than just five, uh, verse 5, we need to realize that, that we're actually letting somebody turn these verses into verses that are adverse. They are not adverse. And you have forgotten the exhortations which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not. The word despise simply, literally can be translated, esteem little. Do not esteem lightly or dis, uh, esteem little. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Now, what are you trying to say? You're asking, I'm asking you, what do you think that this passage is actually telling? And how do you feel about, let's just say, you going through a process like that? Well, I don't know what you think, but I'm pretty sure that most people take this into a negative connotation. Look at this. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Let's look at this. What is this word chasten? Y'all, this is a school term. Educating or training by implication, disciplinary correction, chastening, chastisement, instruction, nurture. Now, you don't want this. You don't want God to actually be like a father that teaches you, a tutor who teaches you the, the, the chastening ends up being your teacher? No, I don't want that. Well, what do you want? Do you want to develop? Do you want to be the kind of person that is able to basically say, nobody can hurt me? Why? Because you've gone through the process where you begin to really realize, because you're being taught this, you begin to realize that men are not in charge. And many of the things that are actually happening they're making you like iron. They're hardening you. Hardening you to what? Hardening you to the difficulties that people put on you. Enabling you to realize that you can get through this. Why? Because you have actually been taught. You have been instructed. That's what the word chastening actually means. It is not always a bad term. Let's look at this. If you endure chastening, let me get this in front of you so you can make sure you, you can see it. If you do endure chastening, now, what, what word are we going to put there? If you endure discipline, if you endure nurturing, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Who in the world is going to leave their child, their son, in this particular instance, Joseph, in a position where he isn't learning? Now, y'all, Joseph has a very big responsibility. I think all of us this morning know that Joseph was having dreams. And we know because we get to read the account, we know what the dreams indicated. That in some way, some fashion, his family was going to be subservient to him. Now, it really isn't the idea as they determined the dream that he was going to be subservient it was going to be, he was going to be in a position that was such that they would need him. If they ended up bowing down to him, whatever. It doesn't really mean that he's their ruler per se. What's the difference? What other word could you actually use? How about deliverer? But you have to be subservient to a certain degree for him to deliver you. Well, we don't like that. Well, that's Certainly the case, they didn't like that dream. And secondly, how in the world is Joseph, the 17-year-old, going to be developed in such a way that he is able to do such a thing? Well, part of it comes from him being in prison. You see how that goes? 
He is developed into another person. So we're going to deal with that as we go along. So what's happening? He is enduring, tutoring. God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? You know, you don't have to murmur at everything that happens. Like the things that are going on with you, like just, just say for instance, you know, um, we're talking to a, a lot of preachers, young preachers especially. If you preach sermons that need to be preached and you get pushback, are you going to complain that you're going to get pushback? How in the world do you actually read and, and, and process your Bible if you think you're never going to get pushback? Man, I get pushback all the time. There are people on YouTube, on Facebook. There are people that call us up. They push back. And what, why in the world would that bother you? Jesus got pushed back. The apostles got pushed back. When you get to 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul says, everybody has forsaken me. He just starts going down the list. Demas has forsaken me. Um, Titus has gone to Galatia. Only Luke or, or Dalma, uh, Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. And then he says, don't lay it to their charge. See, he doesn't hold that against them. Why? This is a process. You start getting used to this. Young guys, if you're going to preach, you're going to get pushback. And so you start getting used to the pushback. You start learning tactics that people use. And you actually start trying to figure out a way to outmaneuver. You don't think that's a part of it? No, I just get mad and go home and complain to my wife and kids. Basically, my kids grow up and they hate the Church of Christ because people in it are a bunch of individuals that just caused everybody trouble. You wouldn't have lasted in Genesis because I doubt very seriously that you have somebody that's fooling around with their father's wife. So that would be Reuben. And whatever it is that the sons of Zilpah and Bilhah were doing, I don't know, but Joseph had to tell on them. So... Are you having to tell on somebody in such a way that it ends up being an evil report and they're not going to like it? Goes with the territory. Yes, that's the kind of stuff you have to deal with. Well, I don't want to deal with that. Well, you're in the wrong profession. You need to go and do something else because if you're not actually wanting to do that, willing to do that, what is the point? This is the Word of God. It is sharper than a two-edged sword. That's what it's about. It's about correcting and you basically dealing with the persecution and the results. There's a lot of, of good stuff that comes out of that. When people actually straighten up or they realize that you're helping them, they become some of the best friends you'll ever have. They'll be individuals that are changed and they'll be sticking up for you because they know you're looking out for the truth. And you just say, yeah, but there's a lot of pressure. So is there not a lot of pressure here? Look at this. But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then you're bastards and not sons. So when we say chastisement, chastisement is learning. Is learning sometimes hard? Why in the world do they have a phrase called the school of hard knocks? Yes, it's hard. Was school, regular school hard? Man, regular school. I'm not talking about any kind of Bible training school. I'm talking about regular school was hard for me. So things that benefit us are often very difficult. Well, we don't want to do that. Well, that's just something about your character. If you're not going to go through anything that's difficult, then you're, we're speaking to your character now. Not verse 9. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and, gave, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection of the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, look at that. It is for our profit. Well, I just don't get, this is what people are saying, I just don't get why profiting has to be hard. Do you have a skill? If you have a skill, you tell me that you were not having a hard time at different times learning that skill. I have several different skill sets. And let me tell you, for instance, being a bricklayer, it was hard. It was, the learning process was difficult. Why? It's manual labor, number one. It's outside in all kinds of elements. It was hard, but it's beneficial. I could make a living at it. I can't now, but I could then. Well, I used to drive a truck. Was it hard? Yes, it was very hard. I did not have a teacher. 
when I first started driving a diesel rig, an 18-wheeler, uh, uh, a tractor-trailer rig, nobody taught me. Our gas rig was broken. I had customers breathing down my neck. Had to get in this vehicle that I had driven around on the yard, uh, moving trailers around, never got out of first gear. Now I'm fixing to take off and deliver my stuff. And there is no telling how many times I had to pull over. It was a very difficult thing. Was it beneficial? Absolutely. I can drive an 18-wheeler now. Everything that we do has some level of hardness in it, and unfortunately, our culture just doesn't want to sweat. We don't want to go through anything that's difficult. We want to moan and groan. We want A lot of preachers are just in it for, hey, this is a great job. Get paid for doing nothing. Well, almost nothing. If, if you're just doing two lessons on Sunday and a Bible class on Wednesday and putting out a bulletin, that is nothing. That is nothing. I mean, that's something, it's just ridiculous that you call that work. Evangelizing, reaching people in your community, getting their attention, finding people that want to study, that's work. And that's what all of us should be doing. So, verse 11, now chastening, chastening for the present seems to be joy, seemeth to be no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth, it yieldeth peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. All right. Exercised thereby. Now, why did we go through all of that? We went through all of that because that's exactly what we're talking about this morning. We're talking about the deliverer. We're talking about the dreamer. We're talking about the 17-year-old son of Jacob who had to tell on his brothers. What are, what are the brothers doing? I have no idea what they're doing right now, but they're up to something quite a lot. So, notice, when what we're going to uh, say at this point is I want you to know where we're headed. We are headed to an extremely, extremely important principle, and that principle is discretion. Proverb 2.11, discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee. So, this morning, as we start talking about the life of Joseph, what we're talking about is how Joseph became the individual that he is, or he was. Let me just go ahead and break this down and make sure that we're, we're ready, we're prepped for what we're looking for. Discretion, it is actually this Hebrew word, and whatever that word is, shall preserve thee. Now, that is something that you really need. Remember a while ago when we were talking? We said, is it possible for any man to hurt us? No. Well, what if they kill you? What if they kill you? What happens after that? It's not like they hurt you. Oh, it might be painful while it's happening, and I'm not rushing into that, but did they hurt you? I don't think so. I know we have Paul on two or three different occasions saying he would rather be somewhere else. He would rather, he's in a straight between two, staying here or being with the Lord. So that would be, if they killed him, what's next? Well, it sure didn't hurt him. You see what we're saying here? We don't think like that. And not only that, we don't really study like this either. All right, so Proverb 2, 11. Discretion. What is this word, discretion? Well, let's look at it. Let's look at it. The word discretion, and I know I have a lot of uh, background stuff up, and I apologize. I don't want to get rid of it just right now. All right, here's the word discretion. A plan. Now, I'm not putting these words out there. I'm not making up these, these definitions. I'm just letting you be able to see how the word discretion is used and the connotations associated with it. A plan. Usually, evil machinations, sometimes good. Oh, you're just going to have to forgive me here. I'm going to have to. Uh, I'm going to have to let somebody smarter than me say that word. So get ready for how do you say that word? Sagility, I believe, is how it is. Let's just listen. Sagacity. Wow. Sagacity, it's a, a word that a lot of us know, Say a person is a sage, that's an individual who is very wise, it is a person who's very witty, 
And let's hear that word one more time. Some people might like to say that correctly. Sagacity. Sagacity. Man, sometimes when you put a, um, like a prefix on something or a suffix, and it's just like all of a sudden you have emphasis on a different syllable, and it's just, I have to hear that one more time. I hate to be a fool. Sagacity. Sagacity. Now, just think sage. Wicked. Device, discretion, intent, witty inventions, lewdness, mischievous, device, thought, wickedly. Now, that's a lot of information associated with that word, discretion. Now, there's two or three different words, Hebrew words, for discretion. This particular word in this particular place says, discretion, what will it do for you? Discretion shall preserve you. So let's just go ahead and use some of the, the words that are used to translate this word. Or this word is used in different places and translated by different English words, but it's still going to be this Hebrew word. So, witty inventions will preserve thee. Let's, one more time. Sagacity. Sagacity will preserve you. How about that? Machinations. They're not always evil. It basically means the maneuvers that you use in order to accomplish an end. That's what we're talking about, discretion. Discretion shall preserve thee. Understanding shall keep thee. Read the first 10 verses in Proverbs 2 and look at all of the information associated with getting knowledge and wisdom. And then you get down to verse 11 and it's discretion will preserve thee. We need to actually have discretion. So, let's notice this. Now, in Genesis 41, verse 33, we end up moving far into the story of Joseph. We're going to skip a few things just for a second. Just stay with me. We have Joseph now in front of Pharaoh, and he has interpreted Pharaoh's dream about seven years of good, years plenty, seven years of famine. And so they're now trying to figure out what are we going to do about this? How are we going to preserve ourselves? And they decide, well, you know what? It would be really good to have a person who was discreet and wise in order to help us through this. Well, how did you find out it was going to happen in the first place? Well, it's this guy, Joseph. He was able to interpret the dreams because God is with him and God was giving him that ability. And so they ended up saying, now, therefore, let Pharaoh look out a man discreet and wise and set him over the land of Egypt. Now, let's see if we have that word. Now, you can tell, tell it's a different word. Genesis 41, 33, 30, Genesis 41, 33. Now, here's our other word. Let's look at it to make sure that, that, that we're realizing it's not the same word. See that? This is our word that we were looking at in Proverbs. Now, I am going to go ahead and close down a bunch of this because it's distracting me now. Okay. Let's get up in front of us. Genesis Forty-one thirty-three. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh look out a man discreet and wise. Now, let's look at this word. All right, here is our word for discreet. Look at that. Totally different in its spelling, but look at what we end up seeing. A primitive root to separate mentally or distinguish generally Understand, attend, consider, be cunning, diligent, direct, discern, eloquent, feel, inform, instruct, have intelligence, know, know, look well to, mark, perceive, be prudent, regard, can, skillful, teach, think, cause, make to get, give, have. Now, that is a pregnant word. Look at all the stuff associated with that. And that's what they're actually doing. Discretion will deliver you. 
let's find a man who is discreet. Well, what's he going to do? He is basically going to help us in these, uh, these plentiful years. And then when those terrible seven years of famine come, he's going to have us in a position where it's not going to be devastating to us. Now, here is, is really where we start our real lesson in regard to Joseph. Now, my hope is that we have set this up. And you have to remember, please remember, that the children of Israel in the wilderness are hearing this too. They are hearing the account of their relatives. Now, I know they would know some things about their relatives, uh, their relative story, but I doubt very seriously. It could be repeated. I don't know. I don't know if they know that Reuben messed around with Rachel's handmaid, one of the wives of Jacob. I don't know if they've forgotten that. We have four generations basically that have passed. I don't know if they've forgotten that. I don't know if they know all of the uh, situations associated with Joseph, the different things that they're having narrated to them. I doubt it. They're getting the inspired narration. And one of the things that actually is taking place, what God is trying to do through Moses by giving them this information is to develop this mindset right here. Deuteronomy 4, 6, keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations which shall hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. There's your word. What is that word? That is the word discreet. It's the kind of person that Pharaoh was looking for to take over second in command. It was an individual they were looking for that had these particular abilities. Well, look at this. The nations which will hear all these statutes and say, surely this is a great nation. It is wise and they are a people of discretion, discreet, understanding, ability, witty inventions. Now, y'all, this should be us. We should be taking into account the account of Joseph and we should be trying to figure out how it is that Joseph ended up being in a position so that he could be so useful to Pharaoh. Now, if you're putting it off on miracles, you missed it totally because that is not the answer. There are things associated with this account that if we can duplicate them, people will look to us for instruction. They will look to us for advice. They will look at us with admiration because they see that we're the kind of people that don't worry about what people do to us. We don't take it personal. We realize they can't hurt us, that somebody else is in charge, and we don't whine and complain all the time about the fact that we're going through tutelage, chastening, nurturing. It is sometimes difficult, yes. Sometimes grievous, yes. But what's the end of it? Profitable. And the children of Israel are being told as they have this information narrated to them that if they will follow these statutes when they get into the land, the individuals will actually have a glorious or, or what, their, what their behavior will do is create glory for the great kind of God that has given them all of this, who has made them this kind of people. Now, just, just for a moment, just take it back some. This is not America today. But it used to be the case that America was like that. When America really trusted in God and was trying to live closer to the Creator and find what is true and right and just and pure and equity, justice, when we were really a nation that was practicing that with, with great desire, everybody looked at the United States and they had appreciation for it. The United States was a, it was a very wonderful and great place. You might say, how do you know, Johnny? Listen, I have lived overseas, and the people that I worked with in all of the islands that I worked in, all of them were actually delivered from Japan, and they love America. Why do they love America? Well, for one thing, America's God is stronger than the empire of Japan. How is that? We took over, and how, did it, how, were, how were things? They were much better. The stories that I heard about the way the Japanese treated individuals in the Gilbert Islands and the Marshall Islands, basically putting a Gilbertese on your shoulder as a Japanese for a lookout and you're walking through the bush and you get shot. And finally, the American soldiers realized that all Gilbertese are short and there wouldn't be any of them with their head 
above the bush like that. And so they quit shooting up. They started shooting down, and the Japanese stopped doing that. But they were using them. Human shields, as we said last week about Jacob using some of his family members that way. They love us. I mean, they had great regard and great respect. Well, that's changed to a certain degree now because we rent all of those islands in order for us to have an early warning system, guided, missile, guided missiles and things of that nature. And now they're just subservient to us and they're just some people that we dismiss and treat very poorly. And so, but the older people do remember America and America gave glory to God. And God was looked at as a great being who had produced this great nation. That's, see how similar this is? And that's what they were going to be doing, and that's why they were getting this narration in the first place. Now, here's what we got to do. We've got to get into the text in, like, when you have this much material, and when I say this much material, I don't know if you realize that we go basically from 37, Genesis 37, all the way to Genesis 50. That's, I mean, we're, we're basically at the end of all of this account, and so this is, it's difficult to try to cover all of the events which are all tied together. So we're going to start in Genesis 37, and we're going to start highlighting, and I hope to be able to, uh, to be able to show you how it is that Joseph became this individual that's described in Genesis 41, 33. Discre discretion will deliver you. So let's begin with some reading. Let's get past the evil report. And Joseph dreamed a dream and told it to his brethren. They hated him yet the more. Why did they hate him in the first place? He is the son, the only son of Rachel, who is the beloved wife of Jacob. Jacob worked seven years for her and didn't get her. He worked another seven years in order to secure her along with her sister Leah. It was no secret. It, it's not wrong for him to have loved her. That's the one he proposed for, and that's the one that he bargained for with Laban. Laban actually mistreated him on that. Every child knew that Rachel was the beloved. Rachel was barren. She wasn't having children. The other handmaids and the other wife, Leah, was having children. So these boys were born, and they realized that their father loved them, but when Joseph came along, their father loved him more. He was the son of his old age. He was the son of the wife that he literally started out trying to get in the first place. Some things you just can't help. And this would be maybe a, a lesson for another time as far as having these different wives and the difficulties that it created. But at this particular time frame, it isn't against God's will for them to be doing this. And so it will later change because of the fact that it does cause problems. All right, now, they hated him yet the more. Now, let's move down. And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we are binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and stood upright, and behold, your sheaf stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. And the brethren said to him, Here we are. Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed yet another dream. And he told his brethren, he said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and his brethren. His father rebuked him and said, What is this that thou, thou dream, this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to the earth, to thee? to the earth, and his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying, and his brethren went to feed their fa father's flocks in Shechem. And Israel said unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send thee unto them. And he said to him, Here am I. And he said unto him, Go, I pray thee, see whether it be well with thy brethren, and well with the flocks, and bring me word again. So he sent him out of the vale of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. And a certain man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field, and the man asked him, saying, What seekest thou? And he said, I seek my brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, where they feed the flocks. And the man said, There departed from hence 
For I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. And jo Joseph went after his brethren, and he found them in Dothan. Dothan. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. Now, you know, brethren, it's uh, when, when we're reading this, the idea of them feeling this way about Joseph, I know that when we are hearing it, we're just saying, you know, um, this is just this is just unbelievable. I cannot believe that we're going to end up using these men in God's greater scheme of things. Now, I want you to ask yourself a question. Let's just be realistic. Do you not think that people from time to time end up saying that they hate somebody? I mean, you tell me that you have never felt hatred for someone, anybody. It could be you're out there. I don't know. If you are, you're a better person than me, and it could be that you're a better person than me than a lot of things, but the idea in your entire life that you never actually hated somebody, that something happened to you, and all of a sudden, for a time frame, you felt hatred towards somebody? Let's see if we can just kind of like um, tease this out of you. If, you. if you're a boy and you ever had a girlfriend and something happened, maybe somebody actually came along and they got her attention and took her away from you and you didn't hate that person, you weren't angry with that person, you had to fight your feelings about that person and maybe the girl too, there's just all kinds of things. Let's just say you ever buy a car and you get the car and you find out somebody cheated you, that it had a, a motor in it that was old and a radiator burst on the way home trying to get the vehicle and you paid quite a lot of money for it. You might say, well, why are you telling that in detail? Because that happened to me when I was in my 20s. And I mean, I really, I was not a... Uh, a person who was living a Christian life, and I had a hard time. I mean, it just, it flew all over me. It caused all kinds of different feelings, and not to mention the fact that I had to do something about this, paid good money for uh, a vehicle that was supposed to be something that it wasn't, and I'm saying there's just all kinds of events. It, just go through your life and see if you can't pull up some of these realistic events and just stop being so hard on these individuals as if none of us have ever felt this way. Well, I never thought about killing my brother. Okay, there are different ways to kill your brother. Are, are you not aware of that? Someone says, well, no, I'm not aware of that. Yes, you are. I don't think there's anybody that doesn't know that in Matthew 5, we're told if you actually look on a woman to lust after her, you've committed adultery in your heart. Well, the way that I usually try to help people realize that you cannot actually put some away, someone away for that is I have to take them to um, 1 John 3, 14. And we know that we have passed from death into life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. That's 1 John 3, verse 15. So you've never committed murder. Well, did you hate somebody? Um, there's some people that it's been very hard not to hate on for a certain amount of time. See what I mean? So we look at these individuals and we act like, well, God is revealing the inner workings of these individuals and if we were standing there right now, we would actually say they're going to hell. Well, you know, that's really not the way it works. God judges people not on just like situations just like this, but the totality. We don't have the ability to make judgment in the sense that we're talking about how God is going to finally judge someone. We, don't, we do not have the ability to be gracious like God is gracious. We're supposed to try to be. We're supposed to try to be gracious, but we don't have the capacity to be gracious like God is gracious. You might say, well, I'm a very gracious person. Well, are you going to offer your child 
for somebody that you, you were hating on last week? Well, probably not. Well, then you're not as gracious as God. You don't have the capacity to be as gracious as God. So what are you doing putting yourself in a position where you're actually saying these people all need to go to hell? Well, then someone turns around and says, well, Johnny, are you saying that we shouldn't condemn anyone? Listen, the Word can make a judgment and we can pronounce the judgment that it is what is said if this particular thing continues. But the fact of the matter is, is they're going to be judged in the totality of their life. And God's ability to have grace is so far beyond what we would be willing to extend. And you might say, well, I don't get that. Well, do you think you could forgive these individuals? Joseph did. Something happened. Let me hydrate here. Something happened in the life of Joseph that caused him to be able to do just that. And that's what we're working at. We're actually working towards this idea of discretion will deliver you. If you can be that kind of person, if you can figure out how to use devices, witty inventions, if you can figure out how to use machinations, in other words, arrange situations in such a way that the Bible is trying to teach us right here in this particular passage, you will, in fact, learn that you can move along through time and not only will you forgive those individuals, but you could actually be planning to make things work out well for them instead of the opposite. Isn't that the kind of people that we want to be? Let me tell you something, folks. If we develop this character, this ability, we will be giving God glory. We will be like Deuteronomy 4, verse 6. We will be said as a church, as a whole, the church of Christ, the body of Christ, it will be said of us, what these people are just simply amazing. Why? Because they have the capacity, they have the devices that they use, the strategies that they work out, witty inventions, machinations by which they accomplish certain things where they're constantly maneuvering and bringing people back into the fold, people wanting to come back in the fold. I had a very great blessing last week. I think it was on a Thursday. I was on the local buzz here, and we were talking about the casino. Um, if you walk out of this studio that I'm in and you go out the front, there are big screen TVs that align the wall, and whatever we're doing in here on television, that's going on the big screen TVs. So a gentleman I haven't seen in 12 years at least happened to be in the studio or in the front area up there, and he was watching some of the buzz. And he sent me a message to be told that he wanted to send me a greeting and tell me he still appreciated, him, appreciated me, and there was more in it than that. And I'm just saying, that was fabulous for me. I just, his name is Russell. Russell, if you're watching, shout out to you. I appreciate that you made my week, you made my month. An individual that hasn't been with us in quite some time, but he's letting me know, not personal. There were some events that took place that they, he was having a hard time moving through. And so, <laughs> that happens. So, <laughs> so, that's the kind of thing that we're talking about. And I had a guy that's been associated with us since 1999, restored in the last month. Had been out of services for, I don't know, 15 years, and we all still loved him, and we're able to manage ourselves in such a way that he was brought back. And, and that's, that's a great thing. That's what we're talking about here. How does this happen? That's what we're talking about this morning. That's what this account is about. Now, here are individuals that are going to slay him. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now for there, let us slay him and cast him into some pit. And we will say, Some evil beast have devoured him, and we will see what will become of his dreams. Now that's something. And Reuben heard it. Now wait a minute. We were, we were down in Reuben a while ago. Individuals got the report. Jacob heard about Reuben sleeping with Bill Bilhah. And Reuben heard that they were going to kill him, kill Joseph, and he delivered him out of their hands, and he said, let us not kill him. 
And Reuben said unto them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that's in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him that he might rid him out, that we might rid him that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. So all of a sudden, we were talking about Reuben a minute ago, uh, having an affair or, or be laying with Bilhah, the handmaid of Rachel, and you've got the other brothers, they know about this. This was all pretty much known. And now you've got Reuben planning to, to, to deliver Joseph from the brothers that are wanting to slay him because they envy him and they hate him. They don't like the fact that his father loves him so much. So one minute we're saying this about Reuben, and the next minute we're seeing Reuben pretty much redeeming himself. He is the reason they did not kill him right out. And Reuben said unto them, let's don't do this. And he planned to deliver him. Now, verse 23, And it came to pass when Joseph was coming to his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him, and they took him and cast him into a pit. The pit was empty, and there wasn't a water in it. And they sat down to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes, and they looked, and behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit it, it, is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh, and his brethren were content. Now Judah is one of the sons of Leah, and so is Reuben. They are actually children of one of the wives, the real wives of, of Jacob. They are born well before Joseph, and they're saying he is our brother. Now, Bilhah and Zilpha's sons, they are brothers too, but they are sons of handmaids, and, and there is a difference in this regard. And so Judah and Reuben, they demonstrate restraint, and even though you might say that that was not very good of Judah to say, let's sell him, but that is better than killing him. And so that's exactly what they did. They're passed by Midianite merchants, and they drew uh, Joseph up out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they brought Joseph to, into Egypt. Reuben returned to the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit, and he rent his clothes, and he returned into his, on his brethren and said, The child is not, and I, whither shall I go? And he's basically talking about the fact that he is the eldest, and he is going to be ultimately held responsible for the missing child, and he knows it. So they took Joseph's coat, and they killed a kid of goats, and they dipped the coat in the blood, and they sent the coat of many colors, and they brought it to their father and said, This have we found. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or no. And he knew it, and he said, It's my son's coat, and the evil beast hath devoured him. And Joseph is with doubt, doubt, rent in pieces. Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him. But he refused to be comforted, and he said, I will go down into the grave, my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him, and the Midianite has sold him into Egypt unto Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's and the captain of the guard. Now, folks, we are actually beginning what makes Joseph the individual that we read in Genesis 41, 33. Where is a man that is discreet that we might put over this business of making sure that we have ample food during the famine? This is the beginning of actually having Joseph be such a man. Joseph is having to deal with things that basically, I want to put it in this phraseology, and I hope that you can uh, process this or keep it or that you, any, that you can accept, accept it. Joseph goes from being the favored son of his father in his old age, the son that wears the coat of many colors, I don't know how Joseph is telling these dreams. I don't know the manner in which he is acting when he tells the dreams. I have no idea his behavior in that regard. I just know that he is doing things that he should do, and that is tell the truth about certain things, and he is being used by his father as someone who can check on them. And I don't think every time he came along that he gave an evil report. But nevertheless, he is a faithful son. 
if you're 17 years old and you're traveling the distance that he traveled from Hebron up to Shechem and then on to Dotham, you look on your map, I believe it's going to be 60 miles by the time you get done with all of this. He is a very able young man at 17 years old. He is someone who's been involved in the husbandry, the keeping of the sheep and the cattle. And so there's just all kinds of traits that Joseph would have. But here's one of the traits that Joseph very likely does not have because this is a learned characteristic. Joseph is about to learn to be accommodating. Now, folks, I just want to tell you, if, if, if you think about this, if we all think about this together, one of the problems that all of us end up having is that we are not used to being accommodating. Now, you might be in a person who is accommodating. You might be a person who is willing to allow yourself to be put off, put down, pushed aside. And even when that happens, you're still willing to be accommodating. You're still willing to actually do things for that person. You're willing to put aside your feelings and go ahead and act in the fashion that God wants you to, to act. In other words, you're basically not taking everything personal. You're realizing there is a bigger picture. What is the bigger picture? We started this, this class this morning with the bigger picture. The bigger picture is, picture is Hebrews 13, 6. Again, no one can hurt you if God is for you. See how that went? No one can hurt you. So when somebody is getting over on you, they're not really getting over on you. It may seem like they're getting over on you, but the thing is, if you have discretion, it will deliver you. Well, how is it that I get this discretion? It's a learned thing. And here is when the class began. He is now in a position where his brothers, he literally heard them say they wanted to kill him. They have thrown him in the pit. If we move to... Um, Chapter 42, I believe it is, we hear the brothers actually talking about his cries and how they did not respond to his, his affliction. So he is learning what it's like now to need deliverance, to need help. He's learning what it's like to be like hated and then acted upon. And not only is this happening, he's in a pit. He doesn't know exactly what's going to happen to him, but then he ends up finding out as he's pulled from the pit that he's now being sold to the Midianites and he's moved off to Egypt and he is now bought by Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's and the captain of the guard. So you might say, well, how is this teaching him to be accommodated? Let's just read the next chapter and let's notice the thing that starts to begin to characterize Joseph. And it came to pass at that time that, up, I'm going to skip 38, that was chapter 38. It is another event associated with the behavior, some of the characteristics associated with uh, the family. You can read this le uh, later, and we'll discuss it on one of our next shows. We're just about done with the book of Genesis, and that's going to be Judah going into what he thought was a harlot. See that kind of stuff that we're talking about? Now, remember, Judah wanted to deliver him, so you've got Judah basically misbehaving in chapter 38, but... If you look at Judah here in 37, he is redeeming himself somewhat in that he doesn't want to kill his brother. He is our brother, but he is willing to go ahead and sell him for 20 pieces of silver, and they don't know what will happen to him. So, and Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. Now the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Now, what we're actually seeing right here is the development that we're talking about. Joseph comes in. Now, listen, y'all. Anybody can make anything they want to out of what they think they would have done if you were in this situation. You've been hated by your brothers. You've been treated well first. You've been favored. You've been hated. You've gotten by with that. You have been given these dreams that you didn't ask for. You are simply rehearsing dreams, and you don't know that you're really going to control your brothers and your father and your mother. You just simply know that these are dreams, 
that are being repeated and you don't mean anything by it, it's just something that is happening. Then you end up on a journey, your brothers try to think about killing you, they throw you in a pit, you're probably as scared as you've ever been, wondering what in the world is going to happen to you. They conjure up the idea to sell you. You have to make this trip with these foreigners all the way into Egypt and your soul to captain of the guard. And what do you do? Joseph, the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. Did we not tell this in the very beginning, Hebrews 13, 6? Is this, now you might say, Johnny, this worked out well for him, and you're saying that all of us should take this into account and that we shouldn't just be horrified when things turn out this way. We should take it on the chin. Well, what are you going to do? Are you going to be, you're going to be the worst servant in the house? You're going to pout? You're going to make everybody else miserable because you're miserable and you miss home and all that kind of thing? No. You basically become accommodating. That's what he's doing. He is being a good servant in the house of his master, and the master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. You know, let me just tell a story about accommodating, being accommodated. You know, I, I don't, it, it really, some parts of telling personal accounts, um, I don't know how you take them, but sometimes a personal account is the best way that I can actually help further a point in regard to me telling you that I understand what it means to be accommodating, accommodative and accommodating other individuals. When I was 16 years old, my dad kicked me out of the house. Now, I was a troubled teen and I ended up living with my dad somewhere close to 17. Um, he basically could not handle me or did not know what to do with me because he had been divorced from my mom for several years. I'm a teenager pretty much raised by somebody else. He doesn't have the skill set to deal with a teenager and I end up living with him in Texas and so I guess he used some mechanation, some device that someone in his family had used and maybe it worked, maybe it didn't. The idea of you think you know everything, how about you live on your own? And so he kicked me out. Now, um, I was pretty close into 17 at that time and so I was right on the verge 16, 17 and I'm sitting on a picnic table at some uh, restaurant like the Sonic, let's just say, it wasn't the Sonic but it was similar to that, a drive through and I'm sitting on the picnic table and I haven't really lived that long in this particular town and I didn't know that many people and so I'm sitting there on a picnic table and I'm telling someone who's, uh, that I do know that's friends with my, was friends with my brother-in-law that I had just been kicked out of the house and I didn't have a place to stay. My dad just kicked me out. And his idea was I would come back because you know I'd get hungry and I'd get cold. Well, a guy pulls up or he's standing by and he hears this and he basically says, I have an apartment. And he said, you can come stay with me for a few days. And so I am thinking, okay, I do not have a place to stay. I do not want to go back to my dad's house. And so I did. I went to his place. Now, what I saw was that this guy was well-to-do. He wasn't always having money, but he had access to money, and he had a lot of guys that were mooching off of him, and they were living there too. He had a very nice, if you remember the 70s, he had a very nice good-time van. I know many of you would laugh about a good-time van now. Got shag carpet on the ceilings and the walls and on the floor, TV, all kinds of stereo. Uh, sound and just special wrap paint job. It was just really a very nice Chevy van, a good time van. And so the first thing that I did is when I got in it, you could tell that they'd been partying and a bunch of people spilled beer or whatever else. I asked him, would you like for me to clean that up? I go down to the car wash and I clean that thing like I would want my vehicle to be clean. And I bring it back. And it's just like the look on his face it just it was it was priceless to me because I realized that I had just made myself a place. What was I doing? I was being accommodating. I was trying to make myself useful rather than one of the the mooches that were taken off of him on a regular basis and just using him. 
Same thing with the apartment. I cleaned up the apartment. I'm trying to make myself useful. I'm trying to make myself, I'm trying to accommodate. And in that instance, that was one of like a very, very hard time in my life. In that instance, I realized that by being accommodative, you can really move yourself ahead. You can actually remove obstacles. You can create a relationship. It just, it's just simply amazing. That's what discretion is. Being discreet, all of those words that we were looking at, it's the devices that you learn to use. Now, that word also had some bad meanings, but that doesn't mean you have to use bad devices. We're talking about discretion in, uh, in a good way. Witty inven inventions. We're going to learn a new word today before we're all said and done. Sagacity. Sagacity. The art of, of, ha of, of sagacity. You end up becoming a sage. What is that? A sage is a person that is known far and wide for their ability to help you unravel difficult problems with your witty inventions, with your machinations, with your ability to maneuver through problems. How do you figure out how to do that? Right here. This is what is actually happening. Joseph is becoming, he is an accommodative person. He doesn't look at the situation in a fashion that many would look at it and be bitter and have all kinds of complaints and just be pretty much useless and thinking that somebody owes him that I know that he was thinking about his father in, in the sense of whether or not he was going to be rescued at some point. But in the meantime, here he is, and look what the Bible says. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And the master saw the Lord was with him, and the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Do you think God doesn't reward this? This is exactly what we were talking about when we were looking at our scriptures earlier. Let's go back to it. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5. And have you forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children? My son, do not think lightly. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked for, for uh, rebuked of him. Let me spread this out so we can get a, more of it. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. What are we doing? Look at this. Psalm 105. What did we say? That was actually happening to this young man. Psalm 105. What was that passage? Psalm 105, 18. whose feet they hurt with fetters, who was laid in iron until the time came that his word came, and the word of the Lord tried him. Now, that's what's taking place. We're actually seeing Joseph go through these difficult times, and Joseph is learning from God. He is learning how to use discretion. Now, y'all, when we're talking about this, we cannot at this point say, okay, I, I'll, I would go through that, but that's about all I'm, I'm willing to go through. Well, that's not how this works. So, the master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight and he served him and he made him overseer over his house and all that he had he put into his hand. Now watch this. It came to pass that from, t from that time that he had made him overseer in his house, and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house. Let me make this a little bit bigger. All that he had in the house, and he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not aught he had save the bread that he did eat. And Joseph was good, a goodly person and well favored. Now, how about that? because Joseph was willing to practice being accommodated. Now, y'all, we all, let's just make some application here. We all have kids. Or we all have raised kids and are raising kids and are raising grandkids. And if you've got grandkids, this is your responsibility. Our kids, why are young people not accommodating? 
it's because they don't know the value of it. All they know is, give it to me, let me have it. Generally, parents don't want to see their, uh, their offspring upset. They don't know how to deal with that kind of thing. Like my dad kick you out of the house. They don't know how to deal with these kinds of things. They don't have discretion themselves. They don't study what the Bible says about raising children. They don't have these principles in place. And so you basically raise up children that you, you just throw things at them to change their mood when they get upset with you because you just can't stand it. And you're giving them things all the time and they grow up and they're really spoiled. And once they start being of age and want people to do things for them that are not their parents, they can't, they just can't operate. Why? Because they're not accommodated. What does that mean? No one is going to do anything for you if you're not going to respond. Young people, you need to realize that people are not put on the earth to serve you. Now, Joseph was a very uh, favored individual as his father's favorite son. I don't know that Joseph was not accommodative, accommodating to individuals. They just may have hated him just because they just couldn't stand the fact that things had come out the way they, they did. I don't know any of that, but I do know this. He is learning now, and this is something that all of us want I have a grandson. I talked to him about this very thing. What you have to do is you have to be accommodating to people. And I talked to his uncle about him. You don't come into the world knowing about being accommodated. You don't just come out of your mother's womb. You don't come out of the house knowing this. You have to learn this. You have to go through a process of realizing that individuals will respond to me if I actually learn to treat them, it's the simple principle of treating them as you would want to be treated, but it, it's a learned thing. And when you say a learned thing, it's something that you have to learn in the sense that you get the results of it. Well, some individuals never get the results of it because they never do it. They don't know the, the, they don't know the value of it. But we're looking at it here. Watch, watch how Joseph moves along and rather than letting this stuff get him down. Now, Nobody needs to think that Joseph's just going around and whistling Dixie or whatever you would want, uh, Yankee Doodle Dandy the whole time. Joseph is having a hard time. We just read Psalm 105, 18. He is being tried. His feet were laid in iron. He was being made iron, literally is what the verse is saying. But how did he handle it? Watch, watch what happens. No, now, all was good at this point. I mean, he is in a good position with Potiphar, but he's still a servant. He still doesn't know what's going on in his homeland, but nevertheless, he's in a good position. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, lie with me. Here we go. You just read the verse before it, probably didn't pay attention to it. Joseph was a goodly person and well-favored. He's a nice-looking young man, and he's a very accommodating person. Everybody appreciates him. The master appreciates him. Next thing you know, the master's wife basically starts thinking thoughts that she shouldn't be having, and she wants him to lie with her. Wow, this is very difficult. This would be very likely the possible. Reuben, one of the other of these persons in the account in Genesis 36 was responsible for what went on. I don't think that there's any indication that Reuben forced Bilhah. So one of the other of them, if not both of them, were committed to this extramarital affair. So we find ourselves right here, and now Joseph is being confronted with the same situation. Did I not tell you? We are narrating life here, and not only that, don't forget again that the children of Israel who have been given this information by Moses are hearing this account. They're listening to how it is that Joseph got in the position to uh, get all of the family, all of the children of Israel into Egypt. They know all about that because they've been slaves in Egypt. And now they're out at Mount Sinai. First time they hear this is Moses is narrating the book of Genesis to them, the writing that God gave. And so they're hearing in detail their family line. Why do they need this? Why do you need it? Why do I need it? I want to be able to make it through this life. I don't want to have to worry about what people are doing to me and what are the results going to be. Let's just look at this word again, y'all. I, I don't really think that it's going to hurt us one bit to look at the meaning of discretion again. I think probably you're more interested in it now than you were when we first started this. 
discretion shall deliver thee. What is this word? This word discretion. Well, here it is right here, and here is the meaning again. Do you want it? I'm saying, do you want to be able to be in a position where you don't have to actually worry about what people are doing? They're not going to get over on you? Now, you might be saying, Johnny, you're sitting here saying this, and uh, Joseph's having all kind of trouble. Is he? In the big picture, a plan, discretion, a plan, sometimes good, saduity, being a sage, wicked devices, discretion, intent, witty inventions, mischievous. Now, these different things that we're saying are involved in this word, they can be bad, but they also can be good, depending on your intentions. So an individual who is discreet is a person, I want to use witty inventions. I want to use the word devices, the means by which you accomplish what it is that you want to get done. That's what we're talking about. And we need to realize that it is not always easy. Look at this. This is what basically takes place. So she cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, lie with me. Man, you're in trouble. Immediately when this happens, you're in trouble. Because when something like this happens, you know that the person is desiring you in a way that is inordinate. And if you say no, there are several different things that start taking place. Oh, so I'm not desirable. No, it's not that you're not, you're, you are desirable, but you're my master's wife. Why would I be desiring you? Well, okay, so I'll be put off one time. And he refused and said unto his master's wife, Oh, my master, he knoweth not what is, is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath into my hand. He has given me full reign over his house and all the things that belong to him. And I just, I can't, I cannot sacrifice that. I cannot do this thing. There is none greater in this house than I. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Okay. And it came to pass, as she spake to Joseph, day by day he hearkened not unto her to lie with her or to be with her. Now listen, folks. This is getting, this is getting intense. Okay, you've had all this stuff that's happened to you with your brothers, your trip with the Midianites, being sold to Potiphar, moving up the ladder by being in discretion. Now you're in a position where the entire house is under your control. And for some reason, your master's wife is bound and determined to lie with you. Now what? You said, we started out with this, that no man can hurt you, that God is actually giving you lessons. You need to endure this. Well, what could possibly come out of this that I need to learn? Well, let's just see. And it came to pass about this, this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business, and there was none of the men in the house with, there within. She caught him by the garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in, his hand, in her hand and fled and got him out. Now she's been scorned. So basically everything that Joseph has tried to do and accomplish by being accommodated, by de using discretion, witty inventions, devices that have moved him into a position where his master trusts him with the utmost trust. And what's he gotten? It? it has nothing to do with him. He cannot help that these are the events of life that consistently plague us. Other pe people's passions, other people's problems, we're going to just have to say that we're going to have to deal with it. So what should you do? Look at the rest of the story. And I think on one occasion we basically said that we're perplexed, perplexed, perplexed people who live in a very complex world. If they don't work those perplexities out, they will drive them crazy. They will destroy them. Well, if you're going to look at a Disney movie and try to figure out what to do next and how things are going to work out, you can forget about managing life. 
you're going to be consistently miserable and you're going to be consistently disappointed. Why? Because their mantra is they lived happily ever after, and that is not how life works. Life is filled with difficulties and hardships. It is filled with trials, but what are those trials accomplishing? Notice, came to pass when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand, was fled forth, that she called unto the men of her house and spake unto them, saying, See, he hath brought in a Hebrew unto us to mock us. He came in unto me to, to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. And it came to pass when he heard that I lifted up my garment with me and fled and got him out. And she spake unto him, a court, uh, and she laid up his garment by her until the Lord came home. And she spake unto him according to these words, saying, The Hebrew servant, which thou hast brought un unto us, came in to mock me. And it came to pass, as I lifted up my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me and fled out. Some of you have been studying with me for quite a bit. You're hearing that word, mock me. And probably your mind is going back to when... Isaac had said that Rebecca was his wife, and or you're going back to, uh, it was sporting there, same word, you're going back to Ishmael and baby Isaac or small Isaac, and whatever he was doing is called he was mocking him. And so you're finding out that this word can have a, a sexual connotation. And it came to pass, when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spake unto him, saying, After this manner did the servant unto me, that his wrath was kindled. Man, all of the things that Joseph has done and tried to do, and the level of accomplishment is all being destroyed by this woman. Now, folks, that is exactly what the devil wants us to think, and that is exactly where we start developing a, the ability to look beyond these difficulties, sometimes molehills that we make into a mountain. I know this would be difficult, and notice what's happening. Joseph, master, took him and put him into prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in the prison. And you, you might say, well, I just don't see how that could work out. Could I give you a little anecdote, anecdotal point here? I've been in prison, and... There are some things that can happen in prison that you would be very surprised that actually accomplish good things. On the trajectory, or the trajectory that I was on as a youth, having been kicked out of the house and getting with these individuals that I was telling you about, all wasn't well with me being accommodated with this gentleman. It just made us best friends, and I was welcomed into a world of all kinds of, of devious, nefarious, uh, dark and seedy behavior that I didn't know anything about and never been involved in. But that's pretty much the world that I had gotten myself into. And I'm saying the trajectory that I was on was either death or some major problems. And so I ended up in prison, and I can t speak to you intelligently about some things that can happen to you when you do not have your freedom any longer. You have to become accommodated. You can become accommodative anywhere you are under any circumstances that you find yourself in. You can practice discretion. You can develop devices. You can develop machinations, plans of action. No matter where you are, you can develop that. We have all heard of individuals that were prisoners of war. Do you think people that were prisoners of war just got a, made it their business well, I'm a prisoner of war, and I've got to be at war with the enemy, so every day I'm going to get into it with my guard. You really think that's how they, how they work that out? No, that's not the way they work that out. There is not a situation that you can develop in your imagination that you cannot work out discretion where you can have devices, learn devices, and practice. It doesn't matter who you are. Now, there are plenty of people that walk around with a chip on their shoulder, and they just hate what life has given them in their mind. Life is just, I don't have what somebody else has, has, so basically I'm upset, and I have all the reasons in the world to act out my anger and my bitterness and all this kind of stuff, and life is just not working out for me, and so what am I going to do? You're going to be a fool is what you're going to be. The opposite of discretion is being foolish. 
Having understanding, discretion will deliver you. Get understanding. Joseph, master, took him, put him in prison at a place where the king's prisoners were bound. And he was there in prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in prison. And whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. Here we go again. Joseph is the type of individual that no matter what he is dealt, he is going to be a person who is accommodated. He's going to try to be involved in doing. He's going to be try, try to be involved in helping. He's trusting in God. He's trying to make out ways, inventions, devices, develop character traits so that he can actually find favor in the sight of those individuals that are over him. Now, you, you know, I know individuals that just basically make it hard on themselves and everybody around them. That's just the way, that's the devices that they're developing. That is simply foolish when you could actually go through the ch chastening of the Lord, in other words, the tutoring and the nurturing that comes from God, and you could learn from every single situation. Situation I'm in right now, I'm, I'm learning. I'm basically learning a lot. I'm learning about being patient and how things are working out. Um, the situation that some of you know about intimately associated with me, I don't know if you know this, but just about every single recording that I need to be able to further a line of um, argumentation that I want to develop regarding a, that particular situation, I have been given it. How? By consistently keeping my eyes single, and that's, ba that's basically Matthew 6, you keep your eyes single on evangelism, kingdom work, be patient, and individuals end up rewarding me by giving this information to me. Now I have all kinds of information that allows me to know what's going on on the other side of this event. I don't really feel that I have to overcome or uh, outwit or achieve. I really don't have to do anything for number one because Hebrews chapter 13. I'm not worried about what men think they can do to me. I might be just going to school and they're actually my the ones that's putting me through this school and they don't even realize it. They may think they're making it hard on me, but I'm just learning as I go. Caleb is learning as he goes. All of our family members are learning. Our grandson is learning as we go. Now, here's how this ended up. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand because the Lord was with him, and that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. Now, y'all, Joseph was 17 years old when this started, and in a bit, we're going to learn that he's 30. At a certain point, we we'll just basically realize that 13 years is going to pass. And all during this time, there are different things that happen. Now watch what's going to happen now. And it came to pass after these things that the butler of the king of Egypt and his baker had offended their lord, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was wroth against two of his officers, against the chief of the butlers and against the chief of the bakers. He put them in ward, excuse me, in the house of the captain of the guard into the prison, the place where Joseph was bound. Captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he served them, and they continued in, continued a season in ward. He served them. Again, he's being accommodated. You're in prison. You, do you have devices that are going to make it better for you, that are going to enable you to be an individual that's giving honor and glory to God? Are you going to be a person who just is troublesome, bitter, mad with the world, chip on your shoulder, constantly causing your own self trouble and everybody around you? Misery. No. The captain of the guard charged J Joseph with them and he served them and continued a season in war. And they dreamed a dream, both of them, each man his dream in one night, each man according to the interpretation of his dream, the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, which was bound in the prison. Joseph came in unto them in the morning, and he looked upon them, and behold, they were sad. And he asked Pharaoh's officers that were with him in the ward of the Lord's house, saying, Wherefore look you so sadly today? And they said unto him, We have dreamed a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. And Joseph said unto them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me them, I pray you. And the chief butler told his dream to Joseph, and he said, I dreamed in my dream. Behold, a vine was before me, and in the vine there were three branches, and it was as though it budded. 
Her blossoms shot forth, and the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes. And Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them in Pharaoh's cup. And I gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. And Joseph said unto him, This is the inter interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. days shall Pharaoh lift up thy head and restore thee unto thy place, and thou shalt deliver Pharaoh's cup into his hand, and after the former manner, when thou was his butler. But think on me. Look at this. But think on me. Now he's been serving them. Think on me when it shall be well with thee, and show kindness, I pray thee, unto me. And make mention of, of me unto Pharaoh, and bring me out of this house. For indeed I was stolen away out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also have I done nothing that they should put me into the dungeon. And when the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, he said to Joseph, I'll see white baskets in my head, on my head. And in the uppermost basket there was all the manner of baked meats for Pharaoh, and the birds did eat them out of the basket upon my head. And Joseph answered and said, This is the interpretation thereof. The three baskets were three days. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thy head from off thee, and shall hang thee on a tree, and the birds shall eat thy flesh from off thee. And it came to pass the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast unto all the servants. He lifted up the head of the chief butler and the chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief butler unto the butlership again, and gave the cup in the Pharaoh, into Pharaoh's hand. And he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them, yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forgot him. Man, isn't that something? Now, don't forget, Moses is narrating this to the children of Israel. They are learning. They themselves are going to be in the wilderness for 40 years. What's happening in the wilderness during this 40 years? They're learning. God is basically saying, look, I proved you 40 years. Do you realize he talks about that further along? The psalmist writes about it. They were going through school. What is the school teaching them? It's teaching them discretion. It's teaching them to trust God. It's teaching them to deal with hardships, things not working out the way that you think they ought to. I mean, seriously, you just enable two individuals to know their future. And don't you know that was a great com comfort to the cupbearer, the butler? And as soon as he got out, the big feast and all the hustle and the bustle is associated with that, he forgets Joseph. I don't know how he did it. I don't know what kind of person that would be, but hey, that's just the way it is. Sometimes when you're being accommodated, sometimes when you're using discretion and devices, that you have used in the past to try to accomplish a good relationship doesn't always work. The person that you're dealing with, they don't necessarily have to appreciate what you've done for them. It just doesn't work that way. The things that we do for people, we need to basically make sure that those people know that we're not expecting something from them for that. That's a part of being accommodated. That's a part of actually finding yourself in a position to do greater things from God, for God, because you think people can't recognize when you're just doing something to get something? Being this kind of person, being discreet, practicing discretion, devices, having devices by which you get things done, that's not always about you. That's the whole point. A person who is being accommodative is a person who is not necessarily thinking about themselves and having to be, have their way. It's just a character trait that you develop, and it is one that is priceless. Everybody loves a person who has this kind of skill set. Discretion shall deliver thee. Get understanding. Figure this out. Now, let's notice what happens then. Now, you might be saying, man, that was just really low down, whatever, that he didn't get out of prison. It came to pass the end of two full years. Man, Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he stood by the river. Where would Joseph be right now? Just ask yourself. I know this was hard, but he's learning. Psalm 105, 18, he is being made iron. He is being made a person who is discreet. And if he had gotten out of prison two years earlier, where would he be? Who knows? But I know this, he wouldn't be where he needed to be 
when the chief butler came to his senses and realized what he had done. It came to pass at the end of two full years, Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, stood by the river. There came out of the river seven well-favored kine or cattle and uh, fat-fleshed, and they fed in the meadow. And behold, seven other kind came up after them out of the river, ill-favored and lean-fleshed. And they stood by the other kind, or cattle, upon the brink of the river, and they Ill, the ill-favored and the lean flesh kind did eat up the seven well-favored and fat kind, so Pharaoh awoke. And he slept, and he dreamed a second time. Behold, seven ears of corn came up upon one stall, rank and good. And behold, seven thin ears blasted with the east wind sprung up after them, and the seven thin ears devoured the seven rank and full ears. And Pharaoh woke up, and behold, it was a dream. It came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all his magicians of Egypt, and all the wise men thereof. And Pharaoh told them his dream, but there was none that could interpret them unto Pharaoh. Then spake the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, I do remember my faults this day. Now then, we are actually getting to the part where you have to put this into your thinking process forever. I'm saying, this is discretion. You put this into place. You put Hebrews 13, 6, nobody can hurt you. You basically put Proverb 2, 11, discretion, learn discretion, it will deliver thee. You put all of this together and it will, it will, it will take care of you because you're actually seeing how things work. God's basic plans do not work according to designs that we set forth. It is simply foolish for us to just go working along as if we're trying to manage everything that, so that it works out in a pleasurable, luxurious way for ourselves. What kind of, of, what kind of experiences are you going to get if that's the way you're going to manage your life? Everything centers around me. If that's the kind of person you are, you're going to have, you're going to have trouble with your wife. If that's the kind of person you are, you're going to have trouble with your husband. You're going to have trouble with your kids. You're, pro you're basically going to be telling your kids one thing and living another in front of them, and they're going to be seeing you live like that, and they're going to basically say, why shouldn't I live like that? Mom gets everything she wants, and if she doesn't get it, she gives Dad a hard time. I'll give Mom a hard time because I'm learning from her, vice versa. Dad gets everything he wants, and he gives Mom a hard time, or she gives him a hard time. I'm going to be the same kind of person. It's just that simple. Instead, teach your children discretion. Teach them to be accommodative. You will move so far in life so quickly, and sometimes you'll actually be in a position where you don't think you're moving, but then you have this information to plug into your head. You are moving. You just don't really know the direction because you're not in charge. You're just basically trying to work out. You use devices to try to bring glory to God. Isn't that what Deuteronomy 4, 6 was saying? And the people will say, what kind of religion is this person in? It's just like nothing really seems to defeat them, him, her. It's just like they can handle anything that comes along. Sometimes they're a bit down, but still, they're still handling it. And they're being, they're using discretion. Then spake the chief butler under the Pharaoh, saying, I do remember my thoughts this day. Pharaoh was wroth with his servants and put me in ward in the captain of the guard's house, both me and the chief baker. And we dreamed a dream in one night, I and we dreamed uh, one night, I and he. We dreamed each man according to the interpretation of the dream. And there was there with us a young man, an Hebrew servant, to the captain of the guard. And we told him, and he interpreted to us our dream. To each man according to his dream did he interpret. And it came to pass, as he interpreted to us, so it was, me he restored into my office, and him he hanged. And Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him hastily, out of the dungeon, and he, he shaved himself and changed his raiment, and came in into Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I've dreamed a dream. There's no one that can interpret it. I have heard say of thee that thou canst understand dreams and interpret it. And Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Pharaoh said unto Joseph, In my dream, behold, I stood upon the bank of the river, and behold, there came up out of the river seven kind, fat flesh, and, and well favored, and they fed in the meadow. And behold, seven other kind came up after them, poor and very ill favored, and lean flesh, and, and such as I never saw in the land of Egypt for badness. And the lean and the ill favored cattle did eat up the first seven cattle, fat kind. 
But when they had eaten them up, it could not be known that they had eaten them, but they were still ill-favored as at the beginning. So I woke. I saw in my dream, and behold, seven ears came upon one stalk, full and good. And behold, seven ears withered thin and blasted with the east wind sprang up after them, and the thin ears devoured the seven good ears. This unto my mag magicians, but there was none that could declare it unto me. And Joseph said unto Pharaoh, the dream, the dream of Pharaoh's one. God has showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good kind are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dream is one, and the seven thin and ill-favored kind that came up after the seven years, and the seven empty ears blasted with the east wind shall be seven years of famine. This is the thing which I have spoken unto Pharaoh. What God is about to do, he showeth unto Pharaoh. Behold, there come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt, and there shall rise after them seven years of famine, and all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine shall consume the land. And the plenty shall not be known in the land by reason of that famine following, for it shall be very grievous. And for that dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. It is because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. Now therefore let Pharaoh look out a man discreet and wise, and set him over the land of Egypt. Now, we just made a full circle. This is the benefit of taking what is dealt to you and developing devices, discretion, developing, develop. These are devices that you use to handle and manage the different things that happen to you in life, as opposed to someone who is over here handling them in a different way. I'm not saying that I have all this down. Life constantly throws different things at us. We're learning all the time. But if we have some of these basic principles in our mind, some of the principles that we were developing in the early part here, then some of these things are not going to bother us. We'll actually thank God that we are, in fact, going to school. In God have I put my trust, I will not be afraid what man can do unto me, so that we may boldly say the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. I know that I have said many times in front of many different individuals, these folk can't hurt me. And sometimes I've had people say, you're just so arrogant, and you just think that, you know, whatever. I believe this. These folk can't hurt me. Define hurt. Hurt is a relative term. They cannot hurt me in the sense that unless I do something, just lost our signal. Can you see that, Jonathan? I can't, these individuals can't hurt me unless I let them. Jonathan. Uh, there it is. All of a sudden, that, that didn't hurt me. Individuals cannot hurt me unless I allow them to. Why not look at a situation that is actually taking place and say to yourself, you know what? So, Jonathan, uh, green screen's not working. So, it's just, it's just me. I mean, it's just the screen. So, I'm, I'm going to keep going in our last part because I don't want to lose our train of thought. You could just as easily say, you know what, I'm, I've just entered school. I've just entered another class. Whatever it is that's going on, I haven't had dealt with this particular kind of situation before, and I'm just in class right now, and I'm basically learning from whatever this situation is, and I'm going to get the best out of it. Folks, that is a device. Why not use those devices? Why not allow that to occupy the place in your head and not end up being the kind of person that just says, well, I do remember that Jacob ended up saying once certain things in our next lesson started happening, he just basically said, why do these things always happen to me? And that's not necessarily true. Jacob did have a lot of stuff happening to him, but our lesson today, folks, is, look, you know the end of this particular part of the story. They basically put Joseph over the land. Who is more discreet and wise than Jacob is? I mean, Joseph is. And so J Joseph begins to prep the land for the seven years of plenty and prep the land for the seven years of famine. 
And we're seeing a developmental process take place that he needed. Now, the children of Israel needed this too. They needed to be able to see their relatives come through events and realize that these events changed them too. And so I'm going to ask you, let you know ahead of time where you need to start. We need to, you need to start in Genesis uh, 40. One, let's get up what we're doing here for next week. I'm saying we really made some headway here. Uh, Genesis 42, uh, you can read 41, the rest of it if you like, and see the position that he ends up being in. But for sure, you need to start in 42 because the family shows up and Joseph is not through learning. This is a very great portion, Genesis 42 through 46. Um, it's just filled with information and it's filled with good material about how to treat each other and a realization that things are not always the way they seem. And so I don't know about you, but I really enjoyed uh, our broadcast together today, our class. I hope that you will share it with someone, teach someone how to use YouTube. My email address is joeblue81 at gmail.com. My cell phone is 276-806-2150. And always ask for, what does the Bible say? God bless you. Good afternoon.